Hey guys, do you know what you would have had to invest in Bitcoin in 2009 to be a millionaire today? Exactly, one euro fifty. But let's not cry over missed opportunities, but rather find new investment opportunities that have the potential to increase tenfold, twentyfold or even hundredfold. But to do this, we need to be brave enough to invest in sectors that are still unknown. This is exactly what today's Bitcoin millionaires have done. They invested before these stocks were even in any financial press. So in this video, I want to share with you a quite unfamiliar investment opportunity. And by that, I don't mean a single stock, but rather an entire sector. As you've already gathered from the title, it's about resources, metals to be more precise. Let's see why I believe that resources are a once in a lifetime investment opportunity that can actually give your portfolio a huge push. For this, we will take a look at the supply, the demand, and then check out what to take into consideration when choosing a mine. Therefore, this video is to understand why to invest in mining companies. In the following videos, we will check out which companies are a good buy. Regarding this video, we will use the word resources or commodities only in relation to metals. Commodities like wood, cotton, soybeans, etc. are excluded. So why should we invest in metals? As with any other stock, analysts evaluate many different parameters of a mining company. One of them, which is very important, is the profit margin. How profitable a mining company is depends on many factors, but especially on the price at which the raw material can be sold. Let's see different scenarios with the example of a nickel mine. The nickel mine has production costs of 5 euros to mine 1 kilogram of nickel, here marked in blue. The current market price per kilogram is also 5 euros. This means that the mine can operate at break even but does not make a profit. In scenario B, the mining costs are still 5 euros, but the market price has increased from 5 to 7 euros. Since the mine's cost price remains the same, it now makes a profit of 2 euros on every kilogram of nickel sold. This corresponds to a profit margin of 40%. In scenario C, the market price per kilogram of nickel has increased to 9 euros. Now the mine makes a profit of 4 euros per kilogram of nickel sold. This corresponds to a margin of 80%. The point I want to make here is that the profit margin at mines can change very quickly due to external factors, so incredible profits can be made. In other companies, the entire supply chain and internal processes are turned upside down and optimized countless times to increase their margin by 0.2% at the end of the day. A mine just has to wait until metal prices rise. That these price increases are realistic is shown by the nickel price trend of the last 32 years. Nickel has, for example, increased by 1000% from 2002 to 2008. For comparison, in scenarios we have assumed an increase of only 80%. Scenario C with a nickel price of 9 euros was therefore still a very moderate estimate. The prices of the resources on the market and the associated profit margins of the mines can therefore increase many times over. This is exactly what will then be reflected in the share price and early investors like us will make a fortune. That's exactly what happened here in 2008 when the nickel price reached its all-time high. At that time there was too little metal for the large demand which resulted in sharply rising prices. Exactly this price increase is reflected in mining stocks. In these charts we always find a similar pattern. Stocks are expensive in 2007-2008 then collapse in the 2009 recession. The stocks recover through 2011 and fall again through 2016. This characteristic can be found in almost all smaller mining stocks that have nickel projects exclusively or at least mostly. Let's take cobalt as the second example. Here you can see the cobalt price over the last five years. If we compare this to different cobalt mining stocks, we can see all the stocks follow the cobalt price. All three stocks hit their all-time high at the beginning of 2018, which is exactly when the cobalt price was also at its highest. As with nickel, you can find a very similar trend in almost all other cobalt mines as well. So what can we learn from this? Within one sector, almost all stocks fall or rise relatively evenly. So it is much more important to look at the expected prices of a commodity than the individual companies. What I also like about mining stocks is that they can hardly go insolvent. Mines have a certain grade that describes a percentage of the desired resource in the ground. Let's stay with a nickel example. The higher the nickel content, the cheaper mines can naturally extract the metals. 
the less nickel in the ground, the more expensive it is to mine. Quite logical, actually. If the market price for nickel is very low, only mines that have high grades and therefore low production costs can mine. Poseidon Nickel, for example, was able to produce very cheaply in 2000 and sell at a high price. Then, when the price of nickel dropped sharply until 2003, all operations ceased because Poseidon Nickel was no longer profitable. When prices recovered in 2008, the mine could be operated again at unchanged production costs. When the mine is shut down, there are hardly any costs. The staff is laid off. There are also no expensive offices in inner cities where rent continues to be paid. The excavators and wheel loaders are sold. During this time, the price of the stock falls sharply, but the company usually remains alive. As an investor, you just have to wait until the market price of the resource is reached so that the mine can profitably produce raw materials again. Sometimes this takes 5, 10 or even 20 years. But history shows that in most cases, mining stocks come back and do not go bankrupt. Before we get to the demand, here's another quick look at supply. It takes about 15 to 20 years from the day a metal deposit is discovered in the ground to the development and commissioning of a mine. During this time, test drilling is conducted. Environmental regulations and other bureaucratic requirements are reviewed. In addition, infrastructure for water, construction vehicles and equipment must be built. This means that if the demand is greater than the supply, this problem cannot be solved short term because the development of the mines take up to 20 years. In general, mining companies can develop new mines if a lot of capital has been invested in the mining sector. Let's see if that has actually happened. Here you can see the commodity to equity ratio. That is the ratio of investments into resources to investments in equities outside of resources. The benchmark here is the S&P 500, which is the index of the 500 largest public companies on the US stock exchanges. A most favorable entry into the resources sector is marked by a low point in the curve. The ratio is of course not only determined by the investments in resources, but also by the capital tied up in the S&P 500. That's why in the tech bubble in 2000, the curve dropped low as everyone invested in the new internet companies and pulled capital out of the resources. The chart shows that now is a phenomenal time to buy mining stocks. Likewise, one can infer from this that tech stocks are overvalued. I deliberately say tech stocks here because they make up the majority of the S&P 500. What the commodity to equity ratio shows us is that in recent years more and more capital has been withdrawn from the mines because there was no real money to be made. This means that mining companies have not been able to develop new projects. The profitable mines have been milked for every last ounce, but too little has been invested in the discovery and development of new mines. As a result, many mines will be depleted in the next five years and they cannot be sufficiently substituted. So even with stagnant demand for metals, metal prices could already be rising as the supply becomes smaller. But let's check very good reasons why demand will not stagnate. Mainly driven by the energy transition, the demand for metals will increase very strongly in the next few years. The fact that renewable energies and electromobility require many additional metals has already reached almost everyone. But now let's take a look at the required amount of metals because this is still unknown to many or almost all investors. At EU level, for example, there are calls for a switch to e-mobility. In addition to Tesla, NIO and other e-car manufacturers, almost all traditional car manufacturers have now also declared the end of combustion engines. VW is converting its fleet to focus on e-mobility. Audi has completely stopped the development of combustion engines. BMW also wants to deliver at least every second model fully electric from 2030. And almost all other Chinese and American car makers are also focusing on electric drive, such as General Motors here. Let's look at the estimates of electric cars sold by 2040. As you can see, the electric car boom hasn't really started yet. Last year, about 3.2 million electric cars were sold worldwide. By comparison, about 100 million electric cars will be sold in 2030, meaning 33 times as many as in 2020. In 2040, over 400 million electric cars are expected to be sold, an increase by a factor of 120 compared to last year. In 2022, the cost parity of electric and combustion cars will be reached. 
From then on, electric cars will be cheaper on average and will penetrate the market more strongly even without subsidies. And with the expected boost of EVs on our streets, there is also an increased need for batteries. Let's take a look at the metals that are in batteries today. The most common metals are lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite, aluminum and copper. These are used in a conventional lithium-ion battery, which consists of an anode, a cathode and a separator shown here on the left. This conventional battery technology is expected to be replaced by a solid state battery in the next two to four years. In this solid state battery, there is no anode anymore. So we're going to focus on the metals used in the cathode. And following Gittelson's words, the metals of a lithium ion battery are likely to be used in solid state batteries as well. A solid state battery also has the advantage of much higher capacity and shorter charging time. The greater the energy storage density, the more competitive the battery technology. But let's focus on the metals now. In terms of batteries, lithium is one of the most demanded metals. Therefore, EV manufacturers are largely dependent on this metal. Even though the electric car era is just beginning, there are already voices predicting a raw materials shortage. And a shortage of raw materials will cause prices to explode and bring unbelievable margins to the few companies operating on the market. An unbelievable price increase will be the result. The same is true for copper. By the way, lithium is not only used in batteries, but also in glass and ceramics, which in 2020 accounted for a total demand of 14% of lithium. Now think about new buildings and their large glass fronts. By ever larger and multi-glazed windows and new buildings, the lithium need will continue to rise additionally. And this demand is neglected in many projections. Cobalt is largely mined in Congo, but also in Australia and Canada. For political reasons, as well as for the cost-efficient production of batteries, car manufacturers are trying to reduce the cobalt content more and more, and even substitute it completely. Today, however, cobalt is still used in almost every battery. I think that in short term, so in the next three to five years, the shares of cobalt mines can still rise sharply. However, I'm still rather cautious about cobalt because it is difficult to estimate how quickly cobalt will be substituted. Nickel also is a very large component in batteries. However, the nickel market is already quite big, so the additional demand from EVs will not make a huge difference, relatively speaking. Nickel is mined either as sulfide or as laterite. Here you should generally invest in mines that produce nickel sulfide, as this is of higher purity and thus finds application in batteries. Nickel laterite is primarily used for hardening steel. For investors, nickel has a good but not very good outlook in my opinion. Graphite is used as an anode material in batteries. After the change from lithium ion batteries to solid state batteries in a few years, there will be no more large anode and therefore graphite will become obsolete. That's why graphite is not an investment case for me at this point in time. Aluminum mines should also be considered, as aluminum is not only used in batteries but also in power cable, which is expected at a higher demand. Copper is not only relevant to batteries, but even more important regarding our energy supply, which brings us to our next chapter, metals in renewable energies. In order to achieve the climate targets, however, not only the transport sector must be electrified, but also energy generation must be based on renewable energies. To this end, subsidies for renewable energies are being spread around the world, such does Joe Biden with 2 trillion US dollars. Governments worldwide are promoting climate protection, including China. Of these huge sums, a not small part will go into the resource sector. A large part of today's power grids are already at capacity and not suitable for the dynamic flow of energy. Power grids were once built to transport energy from large thermal power plants like coal and nuclear power plants to consumers. Today, more and more renewable energy is being fed into the grid at many different locations. The energy input to the grid is also very volatile, as wind and PV output changes depending on weather conditions. In addition, all the energy used for charging electric cars will put an additional strain on the grid. In order to be able to control these new dynamics, the grids must be greatly expanded and investments made on large scale. This requires a lot of new lines and cables, switch gears and transformers. 
and all these electrical components are largely made of copper. The additional cables needed to connect new wind farms and PV systems alone will consume vast amounts of copper. These plants are also mostly installed in a decentralized manner, which means that long cable runs are required. Also transformers that connect different voltage levels include copper windings. So we do need a huge amount of copper to modernize the world's power grids. And it is precisely this demand that, in my opinion, is underestimated by many analysts without a technical background. The financial press mainly reports about lithium, cobalt and graphite shortages, but less about copper, which is in my eyes a mistake. This is because lithium demand is easier to estimate as it only requires multiplying expected batteries by a certain amount of lithium. Mapping copper demand requires looking at many other parameters, such as the grid expansions and reconfiguration. By the way, Corona is likely to accelerate demand for lithium and copper. Stimulus programs are expected to be passed soon around the world, which will most likely be linked to CO2 neutral technologies again, such as subsidies for EVs and renewable energies. In short, too little new mines have been developed to even come close to meeting copper and lithium demand even if that demand were to stagnate. An investment into these mines can mean a hundredfold increase over the next five to 10 years. When the first real shortage of lithium and copper occurs in the next two to three years, prices will shoot through the roof and investors will make fortunes. So what do you need to consider when choosing a mine? The goal is to find mining companies that focus primarily on metals where price increases are expected. In addition, not only the grades should be considered, but rather the production costs, which can vary greatly depending on the geology. In general, I'm also rather reluctant to invest in mining operations in Europe and America, as projects fail more often due to strong regulations. In addition, I only invest in mining companies that are still doing test drilling and developing their infrastructure, meaning the so-called exploration and development miners. These miners are still cheap and will only produce in a few years when commodity prices are even higher. You can also see that some mines are presenting themselves inadequate when these mines are mainly producing metals that are currently cheap. For example, a gold miner with five different gold projects buys another lithium exploration project. This mining company then presents itself to the outside world as a lithium mine when in fact it has its focus on gold. That's why you should always take a close look at the progress of the individual projects of the desired metals. In the next videos, we will check out the most promising mining companies divided by individual metals. Here the focus will be on small market capitalizations, so the companies can still grow strongly. If you like this video and you're also interested in our mining videos, you're welcome to subscribe.